it is all falling apart for Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's relationship with A-list celebrities. Harry and Meghan were not invited to George and Amal Clooney's awards ceremony. Let's be honest, Harry has lost so many good friends, so many good people, so many good family members in his life because he has backed Meghan all the time. I think Meghan going to the hospital in Los Angeles was for her to see if she feels that she's had enough attention she will know she doesn't need him anymore. I can't imagine her being happy with Harry doing well. Harry is continuing some of his own passion projects. That's one way of putting it. What is now a deranged battle with the British tabloid press. And we know that even Meghan Markle has told him, just stop. You can't keep on coming back with new things you have to do where you can't prove any of them. Now, breaking right now, it is all falling apart for Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's relationship with A-list celebrities. Last week, we heard about Victoria Beckham saying that she had never liked the Duchess of Sussex. Now, Angela Levin has learned that Harry and Meghan were not invited to George and Amal Clooney's awards ceremony in New York. Now, Angela Levin, this is really fascinating, isn't it? Because do you remember Amal and George Clooney were some of those celebrities that inexplicably were invited to Harry and Meghan's wedding, even though I'd met maybe once or twice. I mean, they were not real friends. It was all about building a connection. But that wedding invite at Windsor Castle didn't even secure Harry an invite to their awards do in New York, which does show you how much Hollywood is seeming to want to run away from the Sussexes at the moment, especially after the slew of negative publicity in The Hollywood Reporter and publications like that. Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, if these uh, grade one people, um, they would if they would had a chance to decide whether it would be um, Harry or William, they're obviously bound to go along with William because that's where the monarch is and that's what they want. And when they were going to the wedding, they did say, um, you know, we hardly know them. I actually don't know why they invited us, but we thought, oh, lovely, a royal wedding, let's go. So that was very, um, they got that point across very quickly at the time. Um, but uh, they don't want anything where people are attacking the royal family. That's um, a, a big thing that people just don't like. And uh, it was a big mistake to do that. Um, all that moaning and all that attacking and spitefulness. Um, they thought maybe they were going to be victims and everyone would feel sorry and breathe deeply and oh, poor things. But, you know, they haven't. But the George Clooney the thing... First. Go on, sorry. Mm. Well, I was just going to say, though, Angela, the George Clooney thing is really significant, though, because... Remember, after the death of Princess Diana, he was one of the celebrities, even then, who was speaking up, defending her honour, talking about how terrible it was that she was chased by the paparazzi. So you imagine he would have a natural inclination in some ways to back Harry. But as you say, fundamentally, celebrities want true royalty. And I think George and Amal, like so many others, were just disgusted, weren't they, by the way? that Harry and Meghan attack their own flesh and blood. Mm. Yeah, so people don't like that. Um, I think that goes from anyone. When I take a taxi to film something, um, they always say, what are you doing? And I tell them, I say, oh, don't wash your dirty linen, should you? You know, I mean, it's that feeling that goes down for all sorts of people. They just don't like that. And if they like the people they're attacking, particularly with the royal family who don't answer back and want to get into a brawl, um, you, you feel you want to take steps backward because you don't want to get involved in that. You don't want to feel that that's the right way of behaving. The other example of that, Andrew, and you were the first to break this story. So uh, even though the Daily Mail's tried to do it recently, I'd love to hear your insight into it. But the other very famous couple who I mentioned, of course, were the Beckhams, David and Victoria Beckham, who also attended Harry and Meghan's wedding at Windsor Castle. But there he is, William, very publicly last week at the London Air Ambulance uh, charity saying, no, 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 I back 
David. It's fair to say the Beckhams did also have a long-running relationship with William and Catherine. They attended their wedding too at Westminster Abbey. But what I thought was really interesting was this briefing coming from Victoria Beckham, people close to Victoria Beckham saying, oh, she never liked Meghan anyway. And also, just like the Cloonies, they didn't like the fact that Harry and Meghan turned on their own family because, of course, Victoria and David are family people. So given you first broke the story, what, what's your insight into the Beckhams choosing William and Catherine over Harry and Meghan? Well, um, Victoria didn't much like Meghan from the start, but because her husband liked Harry and they could go uh, to the palace and have a nice time, go for tea, um, she didn't do very much. And actually, on the contrary, she was very helpful. Um, the Harry and Meghan were uh, without a place to stay, which they really wanted to before they got married. And um, uh, just afterwards, I can't exactly remember that, but she um, allowed them to use a six bedroom home that they had that was beautiful, large and relaxing. And uh, they let them stay there for as long as they wanted. So they were very grateful. But what um, Victoria did as well was that she gave her some clothes and she also um, got some of her staff to show her how to make herself up very beautifully, how to look after her skin. And she was doing all those things um, very kindly without asking for any money or any payment. But what happened was that somebody leaked it to a paper that this is what they were doing. And Megan was absolutely furious because I imagine that she said, I remember this, that she did all her own makeup. Um, and uh, she didn't need anyone to help because she knew how to do it. But this was actually using Victoria's skills and people. Um, and um, she was uh, absolutely furious. And obviously, if you look back, told Harry that he wasn't to have anything to do with David. Now, David had been friendly with him since 2012, and um, he was offered to go to Australia him to see the Invictus Games because Harry was going to present it all. And so he took a plane which took 22 hours to get there. And he's a busy man, don't forget. He's got so many different things that he does. And Harry wouldn't come anywhere near him. He wouldn't talk to him. And he wouldn't even take um, be allowed for him to be in any photograph. So he obviously didn't dare speak to him because Meghan would have been furious. And so he had to then come all the way back. Now, I mean, that is beyond rudeness, isn't it, to someone who's been all that generous and you just absolutely um, ignore them. Well, um, Harry, let's be honest. Harry has lost so many good friends, so many good people, so many good family members in his life because he has backed. Megan all the time and never stood up to her, which is which is a really shocking thing. And I guess, Angela, we also have this briefing coming this week from People magazine that Harry and Megan are now on a two track path, uh, whatever that means. What what do you think this really means for their relationship for their marriage? Because I remember the time when they spoke about how important it was that they were going to be working together full time. Now they're saying, oh, no, 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 we're completely fine, but we're not going to really be doing much together at all publicly. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I don't buy that they are completely fine. Do you? No, of course not. I think this is the beginning of the end, actually. and um, But they're just trying to sort it out. I think Megan going to the hospital um, in Los Angeles, uninvited, was for her to see how people responded to her so she can work out if she feels that she's had enough attention, mm. she will know she doesn't need him anymore. I mean, there's so many examples of people who she drops um, when she feels she doesn't need them anymore. Um, you know, countless, including her first husband when she sent back two rings, engagement and wedding ring. You know, he had no idea. He was fully in love with her, um, but she didn't want to because now she was getting her own job. She didn't need him. I mean, this is um, something that's run on for quite a long time. 
And uh, as I said, I can't imagine her being happy with Harry doing well. I can't imagine it. She's got to do better. And I think that this is the way they're just feeling for the beginning. Um, and sort of watch this space, I think I'd say. Indeed. And of course, Harry is continuing with some of his own passion projects. That's one way of putting it. I, I, I would call them actually very destructive forces in his life. And one of them, Angela, is what is now a deranged battle with the British tabloid press. And we know that even Meghan Markle has told him, just stop, just enjoy your life. This is madness. But this week, something very fascinating happened in court, didn't he? And a certain Mr. Justice fan court didn't seem particularly happy with Harry. So this is the battle, of course, with news group, newspapers, publisher of The Sun and News of the World. Uh, what's the latest, Angela? Well, the latest is that only a couple of days ago, the um, the judge was gave Harry a telling off, well, not directly, but to his um, uh, people team. who are looking after him, um, saying that uh, it is quite enough you can't keep on coming back with new things you have to do where you can't prove any of them. And this was saying that they left things in cars, they left things in rooms, um, they could hear all sorts of things. That's us journalists. Um, it, and um, he couldn't, he just saying that and then expecting the judge to listen to it. And the fact is that the judge did tell him off and is not to do it again. And his um, sixth uh, judgment against the, um, the uh, all of us um, are, is going to come out in January. It's going to take place. And he doesn't really want to see him again. And the power of that is that if you don't listen, it's a big, big warning, um, then you will find that the whole of the uh, judgment there goes against him and he will be sued for making a big nuisance of himself. Um, but you can't keep going on and on. Um, these have been looked at very carefully, studied. And he said that, you know, there's so much of a queue for people to go through the courts that actually it's, um, it, it's nobody's going to listen to it anymore. Well, I think that's enormous, actually. Um, what his, his um, legal fellows will say to him and how he's going to get around that, I don't know. Um, perhaps he'll think that he can do something in January. But, you know, in a way, it's naive that he, to imagine that he can just say, I'm sure they were putting things in my car and my girlfriend's car um, without actually saying, here it is. Um, you know, this is so much of it is just fantasy. It is just pure fantasy. And remember, Harry has not acted well at all because he has deleted all of the messages, Angela, between himself and J.R. Moringa, the writer of Spare the Autobiography, which is clearly relevant to these cases. That is destroying evidence. I mean, Harry should just honestly drop this, move on, thank his lucky stars, and not risk getting in, in more trouble. That would be my advice. But look, most fascinating royal the story. The other thing is, oh, sorry, you he's, he's trying to still prove that he is a very important royal to do something like that. I mean, most people wouldn't have the energy no. or the confidence to do that, but he still does feel, you know, he's no longer a member of the royal family, a working member of the royal family. So you need to step back a bit. You can't just say, I demand, because Mostly. nobody's going to take any notice. Totally. And he's putting his father in a terrible position. He's putting his brother in a terrible position. It's it's nuts. But look, the most fascinating royal story of all this week, Angela, you've got to tell me about this. Melania Trump, secret pen pals with King Charles? Yes. That's not me saying anything. That was, um, it's her memoirs are coming out today. And um, it was said in one of the American newspapers that she is a, a, has a, a pen pal a relationship with the king. And this has been going on for some years and she's enjoyed it immensely. She thinks she's marvellous. She loves 
um, hearing what he thinks about the air and making things clear and clean. Um, and she thinks he's absolutely wonderful. Uh, and it's a great shock, isn't it? And they write to each other. And I think it's really rather charming. And actually, it will blow away the feeling that the Queen absolutely couldn't stand her husband. Um, I oh, never really yeah. believed that. Yes, I no. never really believed that because he said so much about he's loved her and thought she's wonderful and the most wonderful woman. And that she, but she'd come, other, uh, one writer, I don't want to name him, has said that. Um, she said that she couldn't bear the fact that he was looking over her shoulder to see who would be more interesting to talk to. I don't believe it. You know, if you're talking to the, Her Majesty the Queen and you were absolutely mesmerised by her and you could see it on Donald's face, um, you don't actually want to look at anybody except her. She was such a remarkable woman. So um, there you have it. Yeah, but, I don't. I never <laughs> believe. I never believe that either. Actually. But look, it's going to be a very busy week next week for King Charles. He heads off to Australia on Friday. Angela, yes. news that he is going to be delaying or postponing or at least halting his cancer treatment for the 11 days that he is away with the Queen. So this is a, this is a really significant deal, isn't it, given he's still receiving treatment for this really serious cancer. But going on a big trip on a big royal tour. First though, have you ever wondered what happened to the legendary Chuck Norris? Well, I recently saw a video he made and I was shocked. He's in his 80s and still kicking butt and working out and staying active. What's even more shocking is he's stronger, can work out longer and even has plenty of energy left over for his grandkids. He did this by just making one change. He says he still feels like he's in his 50s. His wife even started doing this one thing too, and she's never felt better. She says she feels 10 years younger, her body looks leaner, and she has energy all day. Chuck made a special video that explains everything. Make sure you watch it by going to chuckdefense.com forward slash outspoken or by clicking in the link in the show notes below this video on YouTube and Rumble. It will change the way you think about your health. Once again, that's chuckdefense.com forward slash outspoken and click on the link in the description below to watch the video now. You simply will not believe how simple it is. Just a reminder, the legendary Chuck Norris is a whopping 84 years old and I have to be honest, he has more energy than me. He discovered he could create dramatic changes to his health simply focusing on three things that sabotage our body as we age. So watch his method by clicking the link in the description box below, but I'll give it to you now as well, chuckdefense.com forward slash outspoken, or you can also scan on the QR code on screen right now. But back to the show. Yes, um, I think it's very brave of him, and I think that this shows how much he loves Australia and how much he feels about um, going there and that even though he might not be extremely well, he's well enough to do it. And unlike him, he's re resting a lot in Scotland so that he will have more energy. A doctor will be going out with him, but I think that doctors often go with royals because they know them and they it's, it's quite right for them to be there with them. Um, and that he will... He will be looked after. And I think if if things he you know is exhausted or he needs extra help, they'll they'll be able to do it. But it is an amazing thing for him to do when he's still not recovered from all the treatment to want to go there. I think such a long flight. Um, but I'm sure he'll be um received with enormous joy and actually a lot of pride that he's chosen Australia to come um to and that he will enjoy it a lot. I think he will he will love it because it means he's really done something that he wanted to do very much. Um and uh I think it would do him a lot of good at the same time, if you see what I mean. No, 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 I totally get that. I guess for me the only thing that was a little bit sad about this news, of course, is that unlike Catherine, it's confirmation, probably the first confirmation we've had in a while that 
Charles is still actively undergoing cancer treatment, which isn't a surprise. We, we knew it was very serious cancer. Look at, look at his age. But obviously, it's very, very sad news. But Camilla, Queen Camilla, continuing to fill a lot of the void that uh, her husband, in terms of her husband, being unable to do quite so many engagements. And this week, quite interestingly, uh, she was at a burial site at Westminster Abbey. Now, this is for something I think they're building as a tribute to Charles, but she found 13th century skeletons. Is, is that right? She's actually a patron of the whole thing. It's a um, a big change at Westminster Abbey so that they have a huge place where people could go on special royal occasions. And um, to do with that, they've been digging things up and they've found a 13th century burial site. Um, she said, you know, she was fascinated by it and sort of said, oh my goodness, there's a hip. You know, she was actually really looking carefully at the bones. I mean, not for me, but she, um, she said that she wouldn't feel the same way if she went there at night. She's going to avoid that. I mean, she's very good at having jokes and making people feel relaxed. Um, and, and that's what it is. But she's done other things too. She's also hosted a, a Queen's Award for Osteoporosis in Clarence House to thank people who have helped with the charity. And this was the first charity that she ever did. She was um, she just got engaged to the then Prince Charles, and she wanted to help. And they said, well, why don't you do this? Because her mother, her grandmother died of osteoporosis and her mother did as well. And she thought she could help. So she very bravely went to the charity, which was very small. And she said, um, you know, could I help you in any way? So, but nobody has to see me. I'll hide. I, I won't let anyone see me because I, I don't want to spoil anything that you can do. And the woman there says, don't be silly. I'm delighted. She says, no, no, I don't think anybody would want to see me. She says, yes, they would. No, you do this. And she started working on that. And this is a woman who's never really had a job in her life. She didn't wasn't interested in a job. She was interested in reading and parties. And um, I she... quite like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, but no, she is working hard now. I will give her that. She's working very, very that. hard. Very, I, very hard. I, I also... the the um, osteoporosis has yes. grown and grown. And she said to me, the more that she does, the more she wants to do because she feels, particularly now, that she's got a position where she can be very, very helpful um, and get others together and they can talk to each other. I bet that was a really nice event because she's very good at that. She talks to everyone, introduces everyone to everyone. And I think that's um, a wonderful thing to do. But she's away on holiday now. She's gone with friends for a, a week or so. So she's, you know, also got the energy to cope with Australia. Lovely. And also lovely, uh, the Duchess of Edinburgh, Sophie, recording one of these CBB's bedtime stories. Yeah, she's, she's wonderful, isn't she? She does things so nicely and she's working so hard. This was often done by Catherine, but, um, you know, she's taken it over a little bit and she's going to read on October the 10th, um, uh, BB's Bedtime Story. Um, it's on World Sight Day and it's all about... Um, a little lion who was very embarrassed that he couldn't see very well and he didn't want to wear his glasses. So she does this story very, very sweetly. And one reason that it's very important to her is that her lovely daughter, extremely beautiful now, um, she was born with difficult eyes and she had a lot of trouble with them. They tried to have an operation to make it right. It didn't make it right. And she had one fairly you know a few just a few years ago and it did and so she does she has a lot of charities which are about um seeing and eyesight and you know she feels very much important that you have to look after your eyes they're so important to you and so it's perfect for her to do that and i'm sure she'll do it very well the other side which i think is lovely is that she's become the patron of the girl guides she was um, that, but she was a brownie, 
So was I, actually. I made a terrible mistake <laughs> when I was camping because I um, had to make a cake and I put salt instead of sugar. And oh, everybody no. were furious with me. I was, I was, I don't think, 12 or something. Awful. I felt awful. But, um, you know, I liked, I liked being a brownie. And um, she uh, has supported it ever since she was a brownie. And that's very nice because nobody's taken over from Princess Margaret from 2002. Oh, wow. So she's now got this job and she's absolutely that, delighted. That's a long time, to, to, yeah, over 20 years with, without a royal patron. And mm, finally, Angela, I mm. wanted to end with Queen Elizabeth II because a uh, little bit of history here. It has been revealed why she didn't go to that very famous mm. handover of Hong Kong to the Chinese after 156 mm. years of British rule. It was, of course, mm. uh, Prince Charles who, who went. And, and we found out why the Queen made a decision not to go. Yes. It just found out why. And again, it just shows what a wonderful, clever woman she was. It was the date was the 1st of July, 1977. And she decided not to go because she didn't want the humiliation when it came to midnight. And that would mean they no longer had any control and it was now over to China. Um, so she wouldn't go. And um, Prince Charles did it for her. And it was a wise decision and another reason because it poured with rain he got drenched and everybody else did and she didn't by staying at home <laughs> Wonderful. Or king charles he, he he drew the short straw but now i guess he would be able to send prince william to those sorts of events although not sure prince william <laughs> would be so amenable to it but well another big week in royal life angela levin so brilliant to have you here and we will speak again next week i love it thank, thank you. you angela Thank you so much for watching Dan Wharton Outspoken. Please click on my face just to the bottom left to subscribe to this brand new independent news source and turn on the notification bell so you'll be alerted to our brand new live shows, uncancelled interviews and special royal episodes. Outspoken is also now available as a podcast so you can listen to the show every weekday on the go wherever you are. You can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I've put some of the links in the show notes below this video. Keep watching our outspoken clips to support this independent news venture with no spin, no bias, and no censorship, unlike the MSM. Most importantly, I promise to keep fighting for you.